How long have you known Haroldson? Well, I met him first together with my wife in 1987 in the ashram and I had very close contact with him many times through the years after that until about 2008 or 9 or something like that when I broke off contact. I think I must have been probably his closest confidant about Sai Baba throughout that period. Wow. He did have some other people who went with him here and there and supported his views, but they were not people who knew anything. They weren't inside the ashram, they, weren't, they didn't know much, so he was very reliant on me. And every time he arrived at my house or we met, he would say, what's the news about Sai Baba? Wow. And he would listen to everything, but he would sort of discount things. And after a long while, I began to realize that there was no go. He had a, an agenda, and that was that he was going to prove that he was right, that Sai Baba did do materializations. Mm. So as to prove his paranormal investigations from the very beginning where he declared in uh, various forms and on various, f various fora that parapsychological events were real, and he was investigating some of those which hadn't been adequately proven the main one of which turned out to be Sai Baba's materialization miracles. He wasn't really interested in anything else but w how mm. and why Sai Baba did these things. During all that time, he visited us and stayed at our house and uh, we gave him a lot of hospitality mm. several times during the 1980s and 90s and I met him on frequent occasions and three times in Prichapati I was together with him. He didn't have contact with any other people in Prichapati that I could notice, just the normal official contacts when you go and ask if you can have an interview and all that sort of thing and the, yeah. odd, the odd discussion with one or two people but he was very much in and out, whistle stop visits at that time. He had spent a lot more time there before when he'd carried out his interviews, but I wasn't there at that time. In order to reassure any doubters as to how well I knew Harrison, one could go to my blog, where I've published all the email exchanges we had over decades. After Harrison's attempts in the 1970s to investigate such a Sai Baba, he only visited the ashram perhaps five or six times, usually two or three days at maximum. Compared to that, I visited nine times over 18 years, and I had intense involvement in the Sai organisation and the Sai movement with many contacts in many countries. I also had a very good contact in Sai Baba's editor, V.K. Narasimhan, who was a real insider and told me all his worries and problems. Harrison was not informed about very many things that went on behind the scenes and in public because he lost interest very largely in the whole process because he couldn't prove any materializations were genuine. However, he did end up claiming that there was no proof that they were not genuine. Now this shows his continual interest in psychic phenomena, which he had from his very early days at Reykjavik University, where he lectured a good deal about Indriya Indriyasam, who was a medium, of whom it was claimed that he could move his body from one place to another, he could produce protoplasm, he could produce voices in the air from people who were dead or long gone, and many another thing. And Harrison was very much taken by this person, as were many Icelandic professors at the time who investigated him. So Harrison's always had an underlying belief in these sort of phenomena and has wanted to prove them. Do you consider Harrison as a reliable and neutral scientist? Well, yes and no. In the beginning, when I first met him, he was the only person who had written a book which contained serious criticism of such a Sai Baba. And mm. I was a devotee and a believer at that time, but his evidence was such 
that I couldn't reject it because he had taken great pains to find out who had supposedly been the doctors of the people who Sai Baba claimed he had resurrected from death. Yeah, I remember that. He came to the conclusion that there was absolutely no basis whatever for that. Wow. And also in another case he was very suspicious, so he couldn't get any evidence, but the claims which were made, which he thought were, were very inadequate. He carried out a, an interview survey of many, many devotees, mm. which of course meant that he didn't carry out a survey which was balanced or neutral or selected right. on the basis of a, a normal selection. He only interviewed people who wanted to talk to him about Sai Baba and his miracles. Yeah, and were true believers. True believers. And he collected up many extraordinary stories about Sai Baba from people who had been with mm. him for a long time. And he was clearly very strongly influenced by it. He did have an interview with Sai Baba together with a, a professor called Karl Usis, who was also a paranormal researcher. And Sai Baba wouldn't submit to any form of testing mm. or anything like that. But Sai Baba said, no, I'm going to test you instead. Sai Baba mentioned during the interview that there was something called a double rudraksha. Yeah. And Harrison said, what is that? I think Harrison took a bait which had been laid out for him. But first of all, Sai Baba sort of brushed it aside and then Harrison persisted and asked. And so he said, a double rudraksha, he says, I'll show you. And he moved his hand and he produced a double rudraksha mm. in his hand. And he handed it around and so on. And then he said to Harrison afterwards, uh, would you like to have it? And he says, mm. I'll, I'll make it into an ornament for you. And he took it back and he and he blew on his hand and he produced apparently the same rudraksha seed with a little bit of gold and a gem in it, which I have seen. And Harrison was very, very taken by that. And Sai Baba said, don't show it to any devotees. It's not wise for you to do that because they take it very seriously. Hmm. So Harrison though, investigated what a double rudraksha was. And of course, being a professor of from a university like the University of Reykjavik. He went to the libraries and he went to the museums mm. and the places. And this, these were full of people who didn't know what the Rudraksha was on the ground level. He was told that they don't exist. We have one which is sort of malformed and that sort of thing. But it turns out you can buy them on the internet. They're uh, prevalent. That's what I thought too when I, when I was there in Kudaparati, but they were everywhere. Uh, Harrison has not followed up on that. I've told him about that. No, no, he hasn't followed up on that. So he was taken in by that to begin with. I think. Harrison and Osis claimed that they had visited stage musicians to learn the tricks of the trade. They'd only been a few hours here and there. Now, in order to learn the incredible things that can be done by people like Milton Erickson and Darren Brown, you need to study them for a long time. However, it's perfectly clear that Harrison did not have the savvy to notice that Sai Baba was putting his hand behind his cushion and all that sort of thing. Robert, do you believe that Harrison is a biased believer in Sai Baba's miracle? He definitely is now. However, he built up his reputation when he stopped teaching experimental psychology by doing a lot of very sceptical researches into various sort of spiritual people, among others Swedenborg, who he discounts, and he did a very thorough job on that too, and others. He, he's known for having shown Swami Premananda to be a fraud, and also Gayatri Swami, who he managed to catch out in a quite ingenious way, because Gayatri Swami used to pull objects out of a, a watermelon and he would pull something out of it. And wow. he, he discovered a very fine string. He was producing left-handed conches, which are considered to be very holy objects in India because they're very, very rare. There are right-handed conches found in the Ganges and all sorts of places, but not left-handed. 
and he managed to figure out that they came from California where there are left-handed cottages and that they were imported and he got the details of the importation. Wow, that's so amazing. He was recognized as a very reliable paranormal investigator. However, since then, he has really gone to the docks so badly that it's impossible almost to say here all of the things. The last words to me when he went out of the door the last time he was here, I was saying to him, do you know that Princess Martha Louise who, of Norway believes in beings of light and angels and many of similar things and that she has set up a school in which she's teaching this where she's also doing healing and he wow. said good for her oh, no. <laughs> and that shows you something of where he's arrived at he's also yeah. written a book about a, the Icelandic medium Indridi Indriason who said that he had been able to transport his own body from one place to another he said that uh, he spoke to the dead, he knew what they were thinking, he produced ectoplasm in the medium sessions and things like that and all those things. And he was a very controversial figure but in Iceland he was very very popular and professors of medicine and what have you went in favour of him and so Harrison was very influenced in that right from the beginning and now he claimed to me, I don't think he claims in the book, but he claimed to me that he has proven that this Indridi character actually did speak to people who had died some long time before. And he'd done this by massive researchers in Copenhagen and Stockholm and libraries and so on. And he sort of pieced together a narrative which seems to show that there was a proof there. But that is how far gone he is. Yeah. yeah. But he has most of the time being very correct in what he said. He doesn't say everything he thinks. And this I found out, of course, because he wants to keep his reputation as a neutral scientist as far as possible. But yeah. it's so evident to me that all the way along he has been a believer in paranormal, parapsychological things which exceed anything that I can believe in, even though I can believe in quite a few. But he feels probably now that he's in such a strong position because he's got so many cronies round about in the parapsychological world. There are various universities which have got parapsychological departments, pseudoscience departments, uh, that he can stand forth and say that. Because there's also a very large public who want to believe in reincarnation, which he does, and things like that. And of course, Saibaba's materialization miracles will prove that there's another world, he believes there's another world, other realms, it's obvious. Another disturbing and wholly unacceptable aspect of Harrison's work is his relation to the sexual abuse allegations against Sai Baba. He told me early on that he knew of these accusations. He'd been told of it by servitors of Sai Baba in Prashantinilium that he abused young boys. Now, he has never once spoken out about that in public, although I have documented what he has said through his emails and what he's told me. My wife and I continually tried to influence him to do something about this because he was not showing any duty of care. He was putting his own pseudo-scientific aims to prove materialization before telling what was known about Sai Baba. 